All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Coalesce. My name is Molly Beitch, and I'm on the commercial sales team over here at DBT Labs, and I'll be the host of today's session, Extend the Rubnaway, a deep dive into snowflake costs. We'll be joined by Ian Whitestone, co-founder of Select, and Jonathan Tommy, engineering manager for the data platform team at Snap Commerce. Ian and Jonathan are passionate about, passionate about analytics engineering and are Instacart and Shopify alums. Before we dive in, I'd like to share a few recommendations on how to get the most out of today's session. All chat conversations occur in the DBT Slack channel, Coalesce Extend the Runway. If you're not currently part of the channel, it's not too late to join. We encourage all of you to ask questions, make comments, and react within the channel. After the session, Ian and Jonathan will be available to answer your questions. However, we strongly encourage you all to ask questions throughout the session. Let's get started. Let's get started. <clears throat> Let us welcome our speakers to the virtual stage. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Molly, and uh, thanks for everyone for coming to our talk, Extend the Runway, a deep dive into snowflake costs. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I lead the data platform team at Snap Commerce. Uh, previously, I've been on, I've worked on data teams at Shopify and Instacart. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian, and I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Select. So Select is a product to help Snowflake customers manage their costs and query performance that will do a lot of the things we talk about in this presentation today. The structure of today's talk is as follows. We'll first give an overview of Snowflake's architecture, which will serve as a necessary foundation for later sections. We'll discuss the cost model, how you actually get billed on Snowflake, and propose a framework for tackling cost optimization. We'll show you how to apply this framework using a few case studies from Snap Commerce. And finally, we'll share tips and resources for how to get started in your own organization. Awesome. So as Jonathan mentioned, we're going to start with a high level overview of Snowflake's architecture. It's really important that you have a good understanding of how Snowflake works from first principles so that the various techniques and case studies we show you later will make more sense when you go about to apply them. Snowflake consists of three different layers, all of which scale independently. So there's cloud services, compute, and storage. And this ability to independently scale these different layers is what really rocketed Snowflake to the market leader where it is today, because a lot of the competitors at the time would only let you scale up everything at once, which led it to be both more expensive and less flexible. The other thing to note is we're going to just focus on the architecture and cost optimizing, optimization techniques for the core data warehousing product that most people will be using today. We're not going to cover any of the newer things that Snowflake's releasing, like Snowpark or native apps or external tables. So let's talk about the first layer, which is cloud services. So cloud services is the entry point for every interaction you'll generally have with Snowflake. It's a consists of a bunch of stateless services that perform a bunch of critical roles responsible for the operation of Snowflake. So things like authentication and access control, query optimization, infrastructure management, so figuring out when warehouses should be up or down, and housing the global result cache. It's important to note that literally everything you do in Snowflake will incur cloud service credits. These are usually really small, so you'll only end up getting charged for them if you're, if you're doing things at a very high frequency. Um, they charge you if your cloud service credits exceed 10% of your daily compute credits. The layer that most of you will be the most familiar with is the compute layer. So this is where the actual query execution happens. And Snowflake uses a abstraction called virtual warehouses, which just means a bunch of compute instances or nodes that will, uh, as we'll refer to them for the rest of the presentation. So if you do a bit of research, you'll find that a node typically has eight cores or threads, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and some amount of local disk space that's available for the query operation. Snowflake uses t-shirt sizing for their warehouses, so extra small, small, medium, large, et cetera. And the important thing to note is that each time you increase the warehouse size, you double the number of nodes in the warehouse. 
So that means you get double the amount of compute, twice the memory, twice the amount of disk space available for your queries. So they tend to run faster, but that comes at a cost. So you also double the number of credits you build each second that warehouse is up. This brings us to the final layer, which is the storage layer. So Snowflake automatically partitions all of your tables into immutable micro partitions. So micro partitions are just small files. Snowflake aims to keep them around 16 megabytes, which is heavily compressed. So there can be millions of these things for a single table, but Snowflake manages all those under the hood. An important concept to understand when it comes to tables and micro partitions is something called clustering, which we're going to introduce here and talk more about later. So clustering can be a natural or deliberate process to group together similar data into the same micro partitions. So if you look at this diagram I've created on the right, you can see an example events table where I have this created at column that is sorted uh, in ascending order. So when Snowflake goes to create this table, it'll take the first chunk of data, write it to one micropartition, move down, take the next chunk of data, write it to the next micropartition, so on and so forth. And what you get is you have this co-location of data where in a micropartition, a uh, single micropartition, you'll typically have records with the same created at timestamp, which becomes very useful if you have queries that have a where filter or a join on that um, column, which we'll talk more about later. If we zoom in to one of these micro partition files, there are two things that are noteworthy. The first is that like other analytic databases, Snowflake stores uses a columnar file layout over a row based layout, which is common in transactional databases. This is much faster for the types of queries that will tend to hit Snowflake with. And then the other thing is that for every single micro partition, Snowflake stores a bunch of statistics at the column level. So they'll for each column, they'll do things like calculate the min and max value, how many distinct values there are, how many nulls there are, and some other statistics. And it uses this information during query optimization when it's planning how to execute your query to figure out what's the best way to do things. For example, what order should we join these tables in? Or most importantly, what files, what micro partitions does this query actually need to scan based on the filters that the user has provided? So to understand how all these pieces fit together, it's useful to study what happens when you submit a query to Snowflake. So on the top left, we have an analyst who's just way too jazzed up to use Snowflake. They submit a query. And the first thing that happens, as mentioned, is you hit the cloud services layer. So you may have authentication and access control happen. So seeing if the user has access to the tables they're trying to query. You'd have a result cache lookup. So Snowflake keeps track of all the queries that have run in the last 24 hours. And if your query's both identical to a one previously run and the underlying data hasn't changed, it can skip query execution and just return the results directly from cloud services. We'll pretend that we haven't run this query, so it has to move on to the next steps. Things like query optimization happen next, transaction management, infrastructure management, where it's deciding, hey, which warehouse should we execute this query on? We then move down into the compute layer where the actual query execution and work happens with the Snowflake reading from your remote storage. And finally, results get stored back in the cloud services layer and then return back to the client. We've learned about the key layers now. So let's break down your Snowflake bill and the key cost drivers. Your Snowflake bill is divided into five sections. The largest drivers are typically compute, followed by storage costs. The next buckets are serverless features like automatic clustering and snow pipe, data transfer like database replication, unloading data, and cloud services. Today, we're going to focus on compute since it is the biggest bucket for most teams. Uh, Snowflake customers um, are billed for compute every second that the warehouse is active. Warehouses cost a specific number of credits that doubles with every warehouse size. So the smallest warehouse available, extra small, costs one credit per hour. The next size up, a small, costs two credits per hour, etc. Uh, the credit to dollar ratio is variable. It depends on the specific contract with your company, but it typically ranges between two and four dollars. The good news is that as soon as the warehouse gets suspended, you stop getting billed. But the bad news is there is a mil minimum billing period of 60 seconds. So let's look at an example. If you run a standalone five second query on an extra small warehouse, you will still have to pay for a full minute 
of warehouse uptime, which equates to one credit divided by 60 minutes. The main takeaways here are twofold. First, warehouses should be configured so that they are always processing queries when they're online, ideally multiple, so that you fully utilize that 60 seconds of minimum billing time. Second, you should suspend a warehouse as soon as it's uh, not running queries anymore to avoid paying for that extra idle time. And we're gonna discuss this a lot more later. Uh, we'll look at uh, a few more toy examples here. So given a contract rate of $3 a credit, a DBT model that runs hourly for five minutes on a large warehouse can add up to $17,500 a year. If you switch this to a daily job, that can return nearly $17,000 in savings. So the main takeaway here is that you should really think carefully about which workloads you want to run at higher frequencies. Costs very quickly compound, especially for larger warehouses, and you end up paying a lot of money for just idle time. So overall, you should really ask yourself, do you need to run this DBT model every hour? We'll look at another example. Here's where the model runs infrequently. Um, a hypothetical DBT model that runs every day for 60 minutes on an Excel warehouse will also cost $17,500 a year. If you're able to get the runtime down by to one minute, let's say by switching it to incremental or other optimizations, that will generate savings of $17,000 a year. What I'll do next is share a hopefully straightforward framework for cost optimization that both of us, both of us have had success applying. So the first two things you need to do are add observability so that you can understand what your cost drivers are. You need to be grounded in knowing what are the biggest drivers of your bill so you can understand where to focus your, uh, focus your time. Once you have that, you can make strategic investments based on how much time you think something will take to fix relative to the amount of money you'll save. And then finally, we recommend instilling some lightweight uh, processes and rituals to keep tabs on things. So on the observability and cost drivers front, the thing we recommend doing to start with is reproducing every component of your Snowflake bill. So for all those different uh, components of your bill that Jonathan mentioned earlier, there's generally a corresponding uh, account usage view on with every, um, every Snowflake account that will either at an hourly granularity or daily granularity show you how much you were built. So you can use that to understand what your total uh, what your total costs were and which which one makes up the most. What you'll typically find is that your compute, this, the costs associated with your warehouse are the largest driver. And you'll often want to get more granular than what Snowflake gives you, which is just the cost per warehouse. You want to know what within each warehouse is driving those costs. So to do that, you need to calculate something we call cost per query or cost per workload. And the method that we've been applying is to take the total of the actual amount of credits that you got billed in a given hour on a given warehouse, and then allocate those credits proportionally based on all the queries that ran during that period. So this is a little bit different than the, uh, the method you'll see Snowflake recommend on their website, which simply takes the query, the amount of time that query ran, and just multiplies it by the cost of that warehouse. So the important thing is to note is Snowflake bills you each second the warehouse is up. They don't bill you each second a query ran. So with this methodology, you get two things. You One can account for concurrency within a warehouse, which uh, the more queries you have running, the lower the average cost per query will be. And it will also account for the idle time that will inevitably be caused by every query you run within Snowflake. So that will get charged back to those queries that ran during that period. Once you have this cost per query, you can group together queries based on some metadata to calculate a cost per workload. So a common example of this is using a bunch of DBT metadata that DBT adds to every query to aggregate all of your queries to uh, each model. And then you can calculate something like cost per DBT model. I'm not going to spend more time on this because I've written about it extensively in the blog, blog post. So if you're interested in trying this out or just want the SQL code uh, to run on your account, you can check that out uh, at the link below. And we'll also share these in the channel later. So once you have these, this visibility into what are your different cost drivers, it becomes really straightforward to pick low hanging fruit. So to give an example of that, you can look at a query and say, do we really need to run this every hour or can we live with having it run once a day? Does this model need to reprocess all the data every single time it runs or could we convert it to incremental? Does this service need to have a dedicated warehouse or could we bucket that, um, those workloads onto another warehouse that is not as utilized as it should be? 
or does this warehouse need to be at this particular size or could we live with some queries running a bit slower? And the final thing we recommend is creating some lightweight rituals. And the, the reason for this is if you make these investments as a one-off, you'll most likely end up in the same place six or even 12 months later. So we recommend one, setting some basic alerting um, to investigate spikes in your bill so you're not caught by surprise and institute something like a monthly or even quarterly review of your Snowflake bill, just so you're aware of what's going on. You can review new workloads, review the biggest month over month or quarter over quarter changes, and you can prioritize accordingly. In, in some cases, you may choose to do nothing, but that uh, explicit decision and awareness is what's key. So now that Ian shared uh, the framework for tackling cost reduction, let's explore a few case studies from my company, Snap Commerce, where we applied this framework and tackled some of our biggest cost centers. We previously talked about why warehouse utilization matters. Due to minimum billing periods, you can end up uh, paying a lot for idle time when a warehouse isn't well utilized. You want to avoid spinning up a warehouse just to, to run a single query and then having it sit idle, especially when it's a larger one. We recommend consolidating workloads onto the same warehouses when they have similar SLOs or SLAs and query complexity, meaning that they can likely be grouped together without much downside. For example, Rather than apportioning warehouses uh, for analysis and ad hoc queries based on team, department, or job title, let's say giving a warehouse to marketing, finance, and analytics, you can probably consolidate these into a single warehouse, which reduces the chance uh, if it's sitting idle at any given point in time. Similarly, you don't want to keep a warehouse at a large size just because some of the workloads require it. You can split your DBT warehouse or even your BI warehouse into different sized warehouses uh, and only reserve the larger warehouse for the resource hungry models and dashboards. And that ensures that most queries still run on the smallest warehouse possible. You can get a lot more creative here, but consolidating is a great uh, place to start. Sizing warehouses correctly is also one of the easiest and most effective strategies for reducing costs. Larger warehouses can improve performance at minimum additional cost as long as the query execution time continues to have. Once you get to a certain point, performance will stop improving as the optimizer no can no longer parallelize across nodes uh, or it gets worse due to over the network costs outweighing any performance benefits. Warehouses should be scaled up for specific workloads uh, when you see remote spillage in the query profile. Remote spillage occurs when the warehouse is not large enough and has to store data in a remote location, leading to data transfer and long query times. But remember that upsizing should only be done after exhausting all opportunities at optimizing your query. One of the best ways to minimize warehouse idle time is to configure your warehouses to auto suspend when they're idle. The minimum allowed value for auto suspend on Snowflake is 60 seconds. One risk of reducing your auto suspension is the loss of a local cache. The local cache can help queries run faster when they rely on the same data as previous queries. But through testing and continuous monitoring, you can evaluate if reducing the auto suspend on your warehouse actually leads to a measurable increase in average query response time. Then you make a judgment call on what's actually acceptable for you. Another concern that we've seen uh, is lowering auto suspension um, because of the uh, additional time it takes uh, for a warehouse to spin up. But we actually found that warehouses provision very quickly, usually in under half a second, so the aggregate effects are ne negligible. In the below example, we, you can see that we dropped our auto suspend for our BI reporting warehouse from 120 seconds to 60 seconds, and we achieved a significant drop in our weekly credit usage without measurably impacting overall performance. Other than uh, configuring, consolidating, and sizing warehouses appropriately, optimizing the queries themselves can also have big effects on overall costs. We previously showed you that queries and DBT models uh, can add up to, to large costs over time, depending on their frequency and how they're constructed. So we wanted to dive in a bit more here. Let's say you have a long running query or DBT model. The first thing you would check is the query profile to identify any bottlenecks. And what you might see is something like the below image where the table scan operators, which are the ones that scan the storage layer, take up the most amount of time. This leads us to the first and most important lesson for query optimization on Snowflake. 
The fastest way to process data is to not do it. So filter early for efficient pruning of the underlying micropartitions. Uh, you'll also want to cluster your data meaningfully, uh, building on what Ian uh, talked about before, so that the queries that run on these tables uh, run a lot faster. Uh, to show you an example, look at the following query, which has a time-based filter. The Snowflake Query Optimizer uses the metadata for each micropartition to determine that it actually only needs to fetch data from two micropartitions. And this drastically reduces the amount of time that it needs to do those table scans. Um, we'll show you a few ways to leverage clustering in your own queries in dbt models. You can cluster your data by simply ordering the data at the end of a query, which organizes the data neatly into the, the clustered micro partitions that you chose. Uh, so when you set a, micro, uh, a, a cluster key on a dbt model in the model config, dbd will actually run two queries. First, it adds an order by to the end of your model so that your final table is naturally clustered on the columns that you chose. And second, it asks Snowflake to recluster your data using auto clustering. For incremental loads in dbt models, you are already consistently loading data based on time and date, typically. And this means that the final table will be naturally clustered and support faster queries. So we applied some of these lessons uh, to one slow running incremental DBT model that was running for two hours every day on an Excel warehouse, leading to $24,000 a year in overall cost. It turned out that despite being incremental, the execution time was driven primarily by two full table scans uh, on large tables, which were then joined using a column called request ID. And you can see this when in the query profile on the right. Both tables were already naturally clustered on created at because of the insertion order of the data. So we did some research, which showed that the request ID was actually unique uh, in both tables, and that the events with the same request ID across both tables usually had very simple created at, uh, similar created ads. They usually happen at the same time. Um, so this meant that we could add new filters into the model that only filtered for the last few days when selecting data, uh, and that saved us nearly two hours of execution time. Uh, Ian, you are on mute. Weird. How about, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. You want to start this okay. slide again? Yeah, I will. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to end off with two loading patterns that should be broadly applicable to most companies. The first one is to avoid large files. So in this example, I've shown a single one gigabyte file that is getting loaded on a small warehouse. So as a recap from earlier, a small warehouse contains two nodes. So we're working with something like 816 cores. And what you can see is that if you're just loading one file, Snowflake cannot parallelize that. It can only use one of those 16 cores in your warehouse. So what you can instead do is split up your file. So Snowflake recommends trying to target 100 to 250 megabyte files. So if we were to split it up into 10, 100 megabyte files, you could see that we'd be saturating 10 out of those 16 cores. So much better. And as a result of that, you'll get cheaper costs because it'll be able to run that single load much quicker and your warehouse won't be up for as long. You want to be careful because the extreme end of this is you, if you have hundreds of thousands of really small files, it can burn you in two ways. Um, one, if you're doing manual copy jobs, it can just slow those down because it has to, we'll spend a bunch of time listing, um, listing those files in cloud storage. And then if you're using Snowpipe, they actually sneakily charge this overhead fee of 0.06 credits per th thousand files. So your cost can really add up and that doesn't even include the actual serverless processing costs. The second tip, um, which is similar to our advice with other queries is to try and use the smallest warehouse size possible. So if you take this exact same example I showed before, we're not utilizing all the uh, threads that a warehouse has available. So what we recommend is you start with an extra small, try your load job on there, and see if the time it takes to load that data is acceptable for the business. If it's not, then you can increase, keep increasing the warehouse size until your SLO is met. 
So to ground this an example, say you had a file that loads in 10 seconds on a medium warehouse. And because your query times generally double with each warehouse change, you'd have four times worse performance on an extra small, so 40 seconds. In this case, either way, you're paying for 60 seconds of uptime. So assuming the business is OK with waiting an extra 30 seconds for its data, you're much better off on an extra small. So we applied this um, learning and found great results. So here you can see a loading warehouse, which was previously a large size, and we dropped it down to an extra small. And you can see the query times, the load times, shoot up, but they're still around a minute, which is completely acceptable for the business. And in this case, was well worth the cost. You can see the, the cost of this warehouse dropped off a cliff, um, more than the one eighth you'd get from changing the size because we also uh, decreased the frequency at which the loads were running. I'm going to end with talking about how you can get started in your organization today if you're interested in diving into your Snowflake costs. So as mentioned, the single most important thing to start with is building up an understanding of what is driving your bill. And as mentioned, most likely needing to go deeper and understand what's happening at a warehouse level. So you are more you can easily do this yourself using the Snowflake account usage views. To help people out, we've put together an open source uh, DBT package that will give you that cost per query and cost per DBT uh, methodology uh, I talked about earlier. And later this week, we're going to release uh, a full bill breakdown. So you can take that, plug it into your dashboards to do regular monitoring, or if you're using observability tool, set up some alerts based on that for spikes, and then institute some type of review cadence that makes sense for your team or business. It could be monthly, it could be quarterly. Anything is better than nothing. And I will end off with some resources. So um, this probably should have been a two hour presentation. We had to greatly distill things down. So recognize we may have gone quick over some stuff. Please feel free to reach out to myself or Jonathan. Both our emails are listed here and we both hang out in the DBT uh, Slack channel. So you're welcome to reach out to us there. Um, we love talking about this stuff. So even if you want to stare at a query profile together, nothing would make me happier. Um, I personally am going to be writing a lot more about this stuff on our blog. So select.dev, um, smash that subscribe button. And then there's a bunch of other papers and blogs that I personally found really useful as I was going about learning all this stuff. So those are listed here. I will uh, paste them into the Slack channel later. And yeah, I'll hand it over to Jonathan. Yeah, and so I echo everything Ian said. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is uh, at my company, Snap Commerce, we're always looking for uh, data engineers and data engineering leaders uh, to join the team. So if this type of stuff is interesting for you, to you, you want to learn more, um, just feel free to reach out to me on the DBT Slack. I'm pretty active there, LinkedIn, email. Um, and yeah, that's it. We really appreciate you coming to see our talk. Someone asked that I bring the puppy up, so he is not happy to be woken up, but this is Brick. He loves he loves cutting snowflake costs. <laughs> Everyone. Well, thank you for the excellent presentation, Ian and Jonathan. If you'd like to stay and join the Q&A with our speakers, stay in the Coalesce Extend the Runway channel to uh, be able to engage. If not, the next session is Escape from Data Island, Orchestrate and Connect Your Data Stack for Smooth Sailing with Shipyard CEO and Data Community Advocate. We hope to see you there. Thanks. See you, everyone.